The world is changing rapidly. Wars and rumors of wars are abundant. Civil unrest, economic collapse, a global economic reset, natural disasters, and the second coming of Jesus Christ is on the horizon. Are you prepared? Welcome to Truth Fed. Greetings and welcome back to Truth Fed. Today is Wednesday, February 11th, 2015. I am Sean, and the website is truthfed.com. Real quick before we get started, if you're a Patreon and a subscriber, Patreon subscriber, you uh, Truthfed subscriber, I want to let you know that the subscriber page has been shut down. We are no longer going to take donations or subscriptions, and I'm just praying, and I invite you to join me in this prayer, uh, as many of you as possible, uh, praying that the Lord will provide uh, for this work in a way that doesn't involve asking you, the listener, for any type of contribution. Um, so we're doing away with that. Uh, you might have been billed for February, but you shouldn't see any more billings moving forward. Uh, you might just go ahead and go to your Patreon account just to make sure you're unsubbed, uh, just to be on the safe safe side, but it should be fine. Uh, I want to thank all of you for praying for my father-in-law. Uh, folks, you know, the darts of the enemy, they continue to fly. Uh, my father-in-law had a heart attack. Uh, you just wouldn't believe, and I don't share a lot about what's going on, but you wouldn't believe how many funerals, how many things, how many, just how many just madness has been happening, how much madness has been happening lately. Um, but I sent out an email last night to those of you who are subscribed to get updates uh, from me, which you can do by just going to truthfed.com. And I'm so thankful for those of you who prayed on behalf of my father-in-law. Uh, his operation went smooth this morning. He got a stent put in. And uh, now I'm asking you to pray that he will have a full and quick recovery. So praise God. And I uh, just thank you so much to those of you who have prayed and will be praying moving forward. Um, you have no idea how much I appreciate you. It's so awesome knowing that I have this family of people, of of people who are hot, who are on fire for Jesus, uh, that I can go to and ask for prayer uh, because I know that it's going to get to the Lord because I know you're godly people who are practicing righteousness and holiness. And I just, I just thank you for that. A week ago or so, somewhere in that range, a couple weeks ago, someone posted in the YouTube comments, I can't believe, I can't believe this is what the vault cast has become. <laughs> complaining uh, that I'm now proclaiming, teaching, preaching, whatever you want to call it, Jesus crucified in his second coming uh, in the near future, instead of talking about the economy and precious metals. And when I read that, I thought to myself, I can't believe it either, brother, but praise God that it played out that way. Praise God that it's played out that way. I can't think of a better way to play out these last days than shouting out from the rooftops that Jesus is coming and shouting it from the top of the watchman's wall. And uh, I'm thankful that this is the way it's played out. You know, it wasn't my plans. You know, I had done, I started an, like a podcast that was kind of a news podcast. I was going to try to make a career and stuff out of it. And it turned into this, uh, which, you know, completely withdraws me from the worldly desires, you know, of starting a business and creating a career because there's really no money or anything like that to be had. Um, but I feel so much more fulfilled. And uh, this is, I can't think of a better way to play out these last few days or these last few, you know, these last days that we're living in uh, than to do this. And I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful that God has led me into this, which has made me draw even closer to him, uh, which is more valuable than anything that we could desire on this earth. So I can't believe it either. And I'm very, very thankful that it's played out that way. If you're new to the show, we talk about the end times because we are living in the last days, folks. Time to wake up, smell the roses, take a look outside. Things are happening. And uh, we not only talk about it and reference scripture and news headlines and things like that, but we also dedicate a time to just reading from the Bible. Uh, mostly we read the book of Revelation and other prophetic books in the Bible because I believe that we are in the very last moments on earth. Now, why do we do this scripture reading? You know, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith, so then faith, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. You say, you know, some of you might be saying, man, you know, I just, I just don't have a lot of faith. I just don't have a lot. Then you need to get your Bible out and start reading it. 
dedicate some time to it. Get up an hour early and read for a half hour. Read two or three chapters in your Bible to get on your knees and, and pray and seek God and, and, and draw near to Jesus. And don't make excuses, ah, well, that's too early. Or, or, you know, don't make excuses that you can't find time to draw near to God and to increase your faith. Because what could be more important? I guarantee you there's an hour or two maybe even three hours of your day that's dedicated to doing something that is not nearly as important as drawing near to God because there is nothing else more important. And I might sound kind of blunt and kind of harsh with this right now, but it's because I love you and because we have no time left. You need to get right now. And faith. You can't do any of this without faith. You can't please God without faith. Hebrews 11, 5 through 6, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, listen to this, friends, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Impossible. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, there's. it's not like it's going to cost you things. I mean, it's going to cost you really things to set aside that time and to diligently seek him. But don't, would you rather have rewards from God? I'd much rather have those rewards from God and diligently seek him and, and be found with favor before God. Why? Because you have faith. You're, and without that, it's impossible to please God. Not only that, faith is counted to you as righteousness. We talk a lot about repentance, righteousness, and holiness on the show, which I know is so, uh, you know, taboo to the American Christian, but it wouldn't be taboo to these original Christians. It wouldn't be taboo to these apostles and to the people who wrote these scriptures. But Romans 4, 1 through 4, talking about justified by faith. What then shall we say about Abraham, our father, as found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Now, does that mean that you don't need to do any works, that all you have to do is believe? No. Let's move to James 2.14, because I like to crush that right away, because people will read this passage and go, Oh, I don't have to do anything. I just have to believe. Folks, if you believe, if you're living in Christ, if you're filled with faith, the works are going to be there too. What Paul is saying is the works themselves don't save you, but it's your faith in Jesus Christ that does. James 2, 4, James 2, 14 through 24. And this is a hard passage, but you got to hear it. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have any works? Can faith save him? If her brother or sister is naked and desolate of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warned, and be filled. But do you do not give them the things which are needed for the body? What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. If your faith doesn't have works, it's dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see how that works there? You demonstrate your faith by works. It's like a symptom. If you have faith, the symptom of that faith is going to be works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You see, you, you can say, well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, well, so does Satan. So do the demons. So do the wicked spirits on this earth. So do the fallen angels. It's more than just believing. It's a way of life. It's a way that you live, which is a symptom of your faith. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, here we go, talking about Abraham, what we just talked about in Romans. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see, Abraham had both. He had faith and God counted it to him as righteousness. He obeyed God when God said, take your son Isaac and put him on the altar. You see, he's got both going. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And his works, faith, was made perfect. You see, you put them together, and it's made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see, then, that a man is justified by works, 
and not by faith only. You see, James isn't contradicting what it says in Romans. He's saying, yes, this is true. You are justified by faith, but you got to put the works together with it. Because your faith, you can say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus all day long. But if there's no works to back that up, if there's no fruit, then you're a liar. Because those who really believe, those who are living in Christ, they're doing something about it. They're praying. They're drawing near to God. When they see a brother or sister who's naked and desolate of daily food, they don't just say, I'll pray for you. They go and get that person some food. Or they take their shirt off and they give it to them. That's what it means. That's what it looks like, folks. So many Christians are lukewarm, and I warn about this, and I warn about it on every show, but I'm going to warn about it on every show. Revelation 3.16, So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You don't want to be that. So you say, how do I get on fire? How do I get faith? Well, you start setting aside that time. Not because it's like, oh, I got to do this. It's a job. Because you want to. Because you want to know God. Because you want to know what his word says. Because you want to draw near to Jesus. Because there's nothing on this planet that you want more than to be part of that marriage supper of the Lamb. Worst case scenario, people you know are gone. You're still here. It's time for the great tribulation. Or you're destroyed in sudden destruction. Which is spoken about in the book of Revelation. And you weren't on fire. You were lukewarm. And you're vomited out of the mouth of Christ. Because you said, I've got the faith, I show up to church, I might even donate a little money, but I'm not going to give up all these things that I love in this world. You know, some people email me and they say, I'm struggling with sin, I'm struggling with sin. And I know what that's like because I've spent most of my life being a slave to sin, to the things of this world. And I just want to real quick share with you a real quick point. And that is that for me, when I started to draw near to Christ, when I started to have an actual fear of God, which you're supposed to fear God, folks, it's all throughout the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. I have a, you know, when you have an actual fear of God and you're drawing near to Christ and you're saying, God, have mercy on me, please forgive me of these sins, you know, and it's actually like legit, like you're, you're not just saying it for the sake of ritual, but you actually mean it. When you find yourself in that posture and the most important thing to you because you're supposed to above all else love your God with all your heart, when that actually starts to take place in you, suddenly you start to change even more than you ever thought possible. Suddenly you don't want to watch that Netflix film that has naked women in it. You know why? Because you love God and you want to please Him. You don't say, I'm going to please my faith I'm going to, or I'm going to please my flesh. I'll be forgiven. That's not what you do. Not if, you're really, not if you really love God more than every, more than uh, anything else. Not if, not if God is number one. If God's number one, that's you, you're not feeding your flesh and saying ah, I'll be forgiven. Or God doesn't really care. We're all, we're all, you know, we're all covered. That's not the attitude of someone who loves God. That's the attitude of someone who loves self. And for some people, that might be hard to hear. And I'm listen. I'm, I'm talking. I'm speaking in the mirror when I say this because that was me not that long ago. And I just use that as an example. There's many examples of things in this world. And I'm going to do a YouTube video about this. Um, because I unfortunately I don't have it pulled up. Uh, but there's a parable in, I believe, the book of Matthew. You know, we talk about the parable of the wise virgins. Um, but there's all, um, and how, you know, they get up and, you know, half of them are, have empty lamps and they, they can't make it into the marriage supper of the lamb. But there's another parable that Jesus tells. And, you know, he says, people go out and, and gather those who are invited to, to my wedding party or my wedding banquet. And they go out and they can't, you know, and they tell people, hey, come, you know, and they've all got these excuses. I can't. I just got married. I got to get home. I just bought a plot of land and I got to go see it. And there's several other excuses here. But what they're really saying is, you know, when you go out there and you say, Jesus is coming back soon, the, you know, things are about to get bad and people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because they've got all the excuses. Well, I'm supposed to get married in two months. Uh, I want to see my kids graduate. I, uh, you know, I've got these, you know, these things I want to do and I want to, I want to see before this time comes. What they're saying, they're saying, I don't want Jesus to come back tomorrow or today because there's these other worldly things that are more important to me that I want to get done first. That's exactly what that parable is talking about. And when Jesus ends up going out or he ends up sending the people out and they just gather random people off the street who are willing to come. 
That's a scary thought, folks. And if you're one of those people and you've been told, hey, last days are here. The last days are here. Jesus could come back at any moment. That's always been true, but it's so prevalent right now. I mean, we are like literally just waiting. Like I'm shocked every day that goes by that I'm not, that I'm still sitting on this rock known as earth. And people don't want to hear it. Not that getting married is bad. Not that getting a plot of land is bad. Not that wanting to see your kids graduate is bad. Not that those things, those, are, those, aren't, necess- those, aren't bad, those aren't bad things. But they are bad if you would rather Jesus delay his coming so you can do these worldly things. Do you understand? And we are in the last days. You should see the headlines, folks. You should see the headlines. I'm sure you are. Just take, just, just take what's going on in the Ukraine. And I've been talking about the Ukraine for a long time. You should see how many videos are on my YouTube channel you, that, that involve Ukraine, Russia, United States, World War III. This thing is blowing up right now. Obama says he's considering sending lethal aid to the Ukraine. That's the Washington Times. Uh, America is doomed. This is uh, according to Paul Craig Roberts, I believe. America is doomed. Never has a clearer fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy been fulfilled before our very eyes in real time. Wow. Agreed. Huge explosion in the Ukraine. Some speculate nuclear. There was this huge bomb that went off in the Ukraine. And uh, some believe it might have been like a small nuke your weapon uh, many are disproving it but the point is is it's getting that it's getting that ugly where explosions are big enough where people are going hey was that a nuke Kremlin says don't issue ultimatums to Putin these words come as EU suspends new sanctions including visa bans and asset freezes to give peace efforts a chance there's this great deception going on nothing coming out of the media is true my friends nothing None of it, nothing coming out of their mouths is true. They're talking heads. There's a great deception. There's a great war coming. There's great famine coming. That's just the worldly problems. And after that, God's wrath is coming. The beast system is here. All, you can't go a single day without a, without a headline of somebody getting chipped. Sexual immorality is off the roof. Satanic rituals are taking place on the stages that are t- of the you know Super Bowl halftime show of of the Grammys, and this has been going on for several years now. And only an idiot can look at that. And I shouldn't say idiot. I just get so frustrated, folks. I don't mean idiot. God forgive me. I'm just saying I don't understand how anybody can look at these things and say to themselves, "Well, that's not a satanic ritual." <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, have you watched it? Have you watched it? You're you're deceiving yourself, folks. You're deceiving yourself if you're buying into these lies. And we know these times are coming because Jesus told us. And he told us what it would look like. And it's starting to look like that. He said it would be like the times of Noah. And if you do a study of the time of Noah, you know there's a lot more going on than just corruption. Did you see where a baby's being created out of three uh, people's DNA? I mean, it's, uh, it's so obvious what's going on. It's so obvious what's going on. Daniel told us that they would mingle with the seed of men. They would mingle with the seed of men. There's so much going on. It's so obvious. All the signs are there. The signs in the sky. We've got the blood moons. The third one about to be here, I believe, in April. And then the last one, September. Also happens to be the Shemitah year and the great Shemitah, which happens to start about the same time the fourth blood moon comes out. Do you understand what's going on here? It's here, folks. And it's time to get close to Jesus and draw near because you might not have tomorrow. This is not a joke. And many of you are going to reject this message. My hope is that when things start to really get nutty, you remember these words. Maybe, hopefully, if there's still access to the internet because there's a 336 page uh, internet regulations that Obama's released, and I may be off the web before you know it might want to download some of these episodes. Let's do our scripture reading and wrap this up. We're reading Revelation chapter 20 today. Uh, this is where Satan is bound for a thousand years. Uh, pretty interesting. Some people argue that the thousand years has already taken place. Some say there's a thousand year millennial period. I say, because I'm going to be honest, not sure. But it appears to me. But again, not sure. It appears to me that the thousand years does take place after Jesus sets up his kingdom. Uh, So let's just give it a quick read, 
and uh, hopefully it blesses you. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And he set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw the thrones, they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Those who number is the sand of the sea. They went up to the breadth of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades were delivered up to the dead who were born in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right, so anyone who says there's not a hell, uh, they need to read uh, the verse 15 of chapter 20 here. And then anyone not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Uh, I don't think that, I, I don't know how much more clear that could be. Um, but anyway, we're talking about this thousand years. Now, I tend to believe that there is a thousand year reign of Christ after his second coming. Why do I believe that? Because it says, you know, that uh, an angel came down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and he chains up Satan, right? And he shuts him up and seals it for a thousand years so that he can deceive the no nations no more till the thousand years were finished, right? Then it says, and I saw on the thrones them that sat on them, judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God and had worshiped the beast on his image and not received his mark. So it says that he's bound up and then he sees these saints who we know that the tribulation must be over because they are the ones who were beheaded for not getting the mark. That's what's going to happen, folks. If, if you're here for the great tribulation because you weren't on fire for Jesus, then your next option is to die by decapitation or receive the mark and be condemned. So those who didn't receive the mark on the foreheads in their hand and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You see right there. Those who were beheaded for their witness because they didn't worship the beast and didn't get the mark on their hands, hands or head will reign with Christ for a thousand years. I think that's pretty pretty clear personally. Now I could be wrong, but I'm just I'm just going to read it again. And I saw the thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. What were they beheaded for? For their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. What else about them? They didn't worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads. So these are people who were there. They were killed because they spoke about Jesus and the word of God, and they refused the mark of the beast. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it's pretty clear to me that there's a thousand-year millennial period 
uh, after this tribulation. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. There we have it again. We know that this is a re the resurrection, right? It's the first one. Blessed and holy are those who take part in the first resurrection. Well, yeah. Because if you don't take part in that one, uh, you're going to take part in the second one, which is where you're judged and cast into hell. So, pretty interesting. And then it says, now the th when the thousand years expired, he's released. And then he will go out and deceive the nations in the four corners again. And then Gag Gog and Magog will gather together to battle whose numbers is the sand of the sea. Interesting. And, you know, and this is one of those things that's just really people have a lot of different opinions on. But I think when we read just, you know, four through verses four through six, it's very clear, I think. I don't think it could be more clear that there is a thousand year reign that takes place after the resurrection. And uh, then Satan is released again. And then after he's released again, we have this Gog and Magog war. So I don't know. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Feel free to share it in the comments or send me an email, sean at truthfed.com. I hope this episode has blessed you. Remember, if you want more faith, all you got to do is start setting aside that time. By the way, don't expect just great spiritual growth in a day. You know, this is, you know, you're, you're supposed to practice righteousness and holiness. Keep practicing it. Keep drawing near to Jesus. The closer you draw near to Jesus, the less you're going to see sin in your life the less you're going to see sin in your life. And that's a good thing. And then you're going to keep drawing more near to God, more near to God. Then you're going to have this hunger for his word. Then you're going to become like Jesus in that you care about the things that he cares about. And then you're not going to be able to stand it. You're not going to be able to stand it knowing that there's lost out there. If you're not thinking about the lost, if you're not concerned for the lukewarm church, if it's not breaking your heart, there's a problem. There's a problem. If you're praying for yourself, if, if the primary goals in your life are worldly things, there's a problem. There's a problem. Not that some of these things are not okay for you to do, but they shouldn't take precedence over your relationship with Christ and over your desire for Christ to return right now. Folks, what he's got planned for us, way better than this garbage down here. Okay? It's not like you're going to be sitting up there on some fluffy cloud drinking tea. No, it's a kingdom. You're going to have a position based on what you did here. You're going to have rewards based on your works. Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. Don't store up treasures down here where a thief can break in and steal it or it rust. No, store up treasures in heaven. He's got, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's a kingdom. There's going to be positions and jobs and things to do. It's going to be awesome. There's nothing on this earth worth trading your eternal life for. There is a place called hell. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The devil and who, de and who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Here it is again. And brimstone. So what happens in this place? And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Just get right with Jesus. And if you don't love him enough, just say it. I don't love you enough. I Sometimes I have to say that, folks. I have to say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm drawing near to you as best I can, but I, I just don't feel like I love you the way I should. Please help me with that. I beg. I'm like, give me the heart of David. Give me the heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. Be honest with the Lord. Get right. That's the show for today, folks. Thank you again for your prayers. Please continue to pray not only... Pray for my father and all. Pray that uh, you know he, that God's healing hands would be upon him, that he'd have a great and swift recovery. Pray for this work that I'm doing. Not that just that I would be blessed, but that it would go forth and that many would be saved because of it. That's the goal, that many would be saved because of it. I thank God for all of you. Peace and grace be with you. God bless.